Hi, thanks for joining me. I'm Mindy Mandel. Today we're going back into Book 7 of Plato's Republic. Now you might find it curious that I'm calling this video Turning the Soul. Let's take a look at why. Last week I talked about the allegory of the cave and here's the drawing that my daughter was kind enough to draw for us and I thank her for that. And we saw, we talked about the journey of somebody standing up and then eventually walking out of the cave and experiencing the upper world. Now what Socrates is going to tell us now is that when you're standing somewhere here, if you're turned this way, then of course you're seeing the shadows on the wall of the cave. To get the kind of education that he's talking about that you would need to get up and leave the cave, it's not a matter of bringing vision into your eyes. You can see just fine. The problem is that you're turned toward this wall. What you need to do is turn around and face this sunlight that's coming in through that opening. And so he says what the soul needs is not to have, it's not, we're not blank slates, he's saying. It's not that we have to put knowledge into us. It's that we have to turn the soul around. Here's how he expresses it. And by the way, all of our translations, as I've been doing throughout the Republic, are from Paul Shorey. So Socrates says, Education is not in reality what some people proclaim it in their professions. What they aver is that they can put true knowledge into a soul that does not possess it, as if they were asserting vision into blind eyes. They do indeed, Glaucon says. But our present argument indicates that the true analogy for this indwelling power in the soul and the instrument whereby each of us apprehends is that of an eye that could not be converted to the light from the darkness except by turning the whole body. Even so, this organ of knowledge must be turned around from the world of becoming together with the entire soul like the scene-shifting periactus in the theater, until the soul is able to endure the contemplation of essence and the brightest region of being. And this, we say, is the good, do we not? So what he's saying here is that the true analogy, so he's like comparing this instrument in the soul to an eye, that, like the eye of the soul that can be turned so he's not saying our soul really has an eye. He's saying it's a comparison. And what we want to contemplate is essence or reality itself and the brightest region of being, which is a reference to the sun in the allegory of the cave. And the brightest region implies that this region, the intelligible region, admits of degrees. Okay, he goes on to say, of this very thing then, there might be an art, an art of the speediest and most effective shifting or conversion of the soul. Not an art of producing vision in it, but on the assumption that the soul already possesses vision, but does not rightly direct it and does not look where it should. So what we need is an art of bringing this about. So what we're working on here, what we're focused on, is this leg of our journey. We've already stood up, we've looked around, we've gotten somewhat familiar with our surroundings. We realize that this, these shadows on the wall are not reality itself. So now we're on this leg of our journey where we're looking to get out of the cave. And what are the studies or the, the techniques, the practices that would help us get out? So this, it seems, would not be the whirling of the shell in the children's game, but a conversion and turning about of the soul from a day whose light is darkness to the veritable day. That ascension to reality of our parable, which we affirm to be true philosophy, by all means. Must we not then consider what studies have the power to effect this? Of course. And so with that introduction, Socrates is then going to name five different studies. So first I'm just going to list them and then I'll say a few words about them. So there's arithmetic, geometry, 
solid geometry, astronomy, and harmony. Now, he's going to go back into that whole analogy of the city-state to the soul, which means there are two ways to understand these topics. You could imagine, well, well, first of all, of course, he's talking about them on the city-state level, but you can either just apply it to the soul and think it has nothing at all to do with arithmetic or geometry or astronomy, and that's a perfectly fine way to approach it. And actually, if you're a person who does not like these topics, um, you don't have to be turned off to Platonism. It's entirely possible to get into this study without doing these studies. You don't have to do geometry or get into astronomy or so on. But it is actually possible also to use these topics, but in a way that better applies them to the goals that he's talking about. So what he's going to do, what Socrates is going to do with each of these topics is talk about the true goal as he sees it. And so here he's talking about how this helps the soul turn around. All right, so first we're going to start with arithmetic. He says, Shall we not then set down as a study requisite for a soldier the ability to reckon and number? And we see here that Glaucon has a very high opinion of math. He says, Most certainly, if he is to know anything, whatever, of the ordering of his troops, or rather, if he's to be a man at all. all right, so that's what you can tell your uh, elementary school son, if he asks why he has to do math, you say, hey, if you want to be a man at all, you need to know this. But um, what Socrates is really talking about is hinted at right here in the word soldier. In the analogy of the city-state to the soul, you may remember that the soldiers represented the high-spirited part of the soul. This is the part of the soul that fights for wisdom and that protects the wisdom-loving part of the soul as the leader of the soul. It does not let, it's the home of courage, so it does not let us get distracted from what is most meaningful. It doesn't let any pleasure or pain distract us. And so he's saying here that this study that he's calling arithmetic, what he really means by it is that it's a study that will give us that focus. Right. It seems likely that it is one of those studies which we are seeking that, nat that naturally conduce to the awakening of thought, but that no one makes the right use of, though it really does tend to draw the mind to essence and reality. So whatever he means by arithmetic, it is going to draw the mind to essence and reality, that upper world, what's in the metaphysical flowchart was the intelligible realm, or the realm of absolute reality. He goes on to talk about unity. He says, if unity is adequately seen by itself or apprehended by some other sensation, it would not tend to draw the mind to the apprehension of essence. But if some contradiction is always seen coincidentally with it, so that it no more appears to be one than the opposite, there would forthwith be need of something to judge between them, and it would compel the soul to be at a loss and to inquire by arousing thoughts in itself and to ask, whatever then is the one as such? And thus the study of unity will be one of the studies that guide and convert the soul to the contemplation of true being. What he's saying here by talking about the one as such means he wants to go beyond our, our just concept of one, beyond physical things. Like here, you can see I have kids. Um, here's a school eraser. Um, we can call it one eraser, but also we can see that if we were to break it up into pieces, we would have many little erasers, but each is a one. So there's something about unity that gives things existence. Once, it, once something loses its unity, it no longer exists as a thing it was. If I were to erase many things until this whole thing is gone, I would no longer have an eraser. I'd have a bunch of crumbs, and I'd have many, many crumbs, and each crumb would be a one, but it no longer exists as an eraser. And so one, he's saying, is more than just a concept. It's more than just a convenience that we can count things for, you know, in the physical world. There's something about one 
that points to existence itself. And so in Platonism, another name for the good is the one. Not that it is one, but more that it's the, the unity within us that we recognize when we're contemplating that first cause. And so if unity is, is at the root of all existence, then there's something about one that goes beyond the concept of one as a counter. And so that's the first contemplation, the contemplation of true being. This is a study that guides us to that and helps turn the soul. This is a meditation that we carry with us as we're going through all these various dialogues and also as we go through, say, Proclus or Plotinus or any of the later Platonists. This is one of the questions that is always in the back of our mind in all of our contemplations. Um, Glaucon says that surely the visual perception of it does especially involve this, for we see the same thing at once as one and as an indefinite plurality. What does he mean by that? Well, here's a, this is actually a, it's a paperweight, it's a rock that's been painted by one of my kids. Um, so it's one rock. Again, we can break it up into many rocks. We can also see it as molecules, and each molecule can be broken down into its parts, and it goes on indefinitely. It's an indefinite plurality, even though it's, at the same time, a one. Socrates says, If this is true of the one, the same holds for all number, does it not? Of course. But further, reckoning and the science of arithmetic are wholly concerned with number. They are indeed. And the qualities of number appear to lead to the apprehension of truth beyond anything. Then, as it seems, these would be among the studies that we are seeking. For a soldier must learn them in order to marshal his troops. And a philosopher, because he must rise out of the region of generation and lay hold on essence, or he can never become a true reckoner. It is so. So you can use mathematics if you are a person who has a certain interest in that, if you have a penchant for that. It can absolutely be a doorway into the divine. And many people do use it that way, like the pure mathematics, more abstract mathematics that you can study at the university level. So that's one way to approach it. If you're not interested in math, still keeping this idea of the essence beyond the physical world is that focus is getting you to focus on what is outside of the cave and so it's part of that um, study to turn the soul. Socrates goes on to say that it is befitting then Glaucon that this branch of learning should be prescribed by our law and that we should induce those who are to share the highest function of state to enter upon that study of calculation and take hold of it not as amateurs but to follow it up until they attain to the contemplation of the nature of number, number itself, by pure thought, not for the purpose of buying and selling, as if they were preparing to be merchants or hucksters, but for the uses of war, fighting for knowledge, for wisdom, and for facilitating the conversion of the soul itself to the world of generation, I'm sorry, from the world of generation, to essence and truth. Okay, and that, my friends, is arithmetic. And now let's see what he's going to say about geometry. Now with arithmetic, Socrates was kind enough, of, kind enough to give us an actual meditation question to focus on. What is the one as such, or the one in itself? He doesn't actually give us such a question in geometry, but he makes it very clear what his goal is. He says, what we have to consider is whether the greater and more advanced part of geometry tends to facilitate the apprehension of the idea of the good, represented in the cave allegory as the sun itself. He says, that tendency, we affirm, is to be found in all studies that force the soul to turn its vision round to the region where dwells the most blessed part of reality which it is imperative that it should behold. Most blessed part, again implying that reality admits of degrees. Glaucon says, you are right. Socrates says, 
then if it compels the soul to contemplate essence, it is suitable. But if Genesis, it is not. So again, we want to focus on what is in that upper world. And then when he's talking about those who practice geometry, as we all learned it in school, he says, their language is most ludicrous, though they cannot help it. For they speak as if they were doing something, and as if all their words were directed toward action. For all their talk is of squaring and applying and adding and the like. Whereas, in fact, the real object of the entire study is pure knowledge. So remember that in the metaphysical flowcharts that I gave before, we saw that the upper world is that intelligible region. And what that corresponds to in terms of the, um, the divided line is the faculty of knowledge. And so that realm, that upper world, is the realm of pure knowledge. Those are the only true objects of knowledge, as Socrates is using the word here. And so that is the real object of the entire study of geometry. So again, we can use actual geometry, like I know many people want to read the um, Euclid's um, Elements of Geometry, and it gets you into the abstract, get starting with axioms and building slowly on it. Also, Proclus's theology, or I'm sorry, his um, Elements of Theology is actually based on Euclid. He followed that same pattern, but instead of focusing on math, he is looking at the elements of theology, just as the title says. He's looking at the metaphysics and building it. And so, again, it gets you into that study. If you're not a person who likes math, you don't have to go there. But you can get into that kind of, uh, I don't like the word abstract, but we'll call it abstract thinking, that um, realm of mind, turning away from the physical world and thinking about absolute realities, that realm that never changes. That's the study of geom. That's what he means by geometry. He says, Then, my good friend, it would tend to draw the soul to truth and would be productive of a philosophical attitude of mind, directing upward the faculties that now wrongly are turned earthward. And he goes on to say that there is in every soul an organ or instrument of knowledge that is purified and kindled afresh by such studies when it has been destroyed and blinded by our ordinary pursuits, a faculty whose preservation outweighs 10,000 eyes, for by it only is reality beheld. Okay, so that's what he says about geometry, and now he's going to go on to solid geometry. Now, I put the Stephanus numbers here, and you may notice that these sections are all very different lengths. Arithmetic is the longest, and solid geometry is by far the shortest. What we're going to see here is that Socrates is not here talking about an actual study, per se. What he's talking about here is the attitude that we, as students of metaphysics, as students of philosophy, need to have in order to really do well on this leg of our journey. So he says that there are two reasons that this study gets neglected. First, that no city holds them in honor. And remember, again, this is the there is an analogy going on here of the city to the soul. So, of course, he's saying here that no soul holds them in honor. And he also says that the investigators need a director who is indispensable for success. Now, this director or teacher or guide may be an actual person, like Socrates was to the people he he spoke with, or it may be the people we read in books, like the way Socrates is for us. Eventually, we want to get in touch with that inner guide, if you will, the, the voice in our soul, the wisdom in our soul, when we can open up that avenue of communication as we get more developed than we have a teacher who's always with us. That's eventually where we're going, but Anyway, we need somebody to help us. It's just like in the allegory, there was the person who was pointing things out to the person who first stood up and also somebody who dragged the person kicking and screaming up the ascent. That person is functioning 
as a teacher, as a guide. It's just too difficult without, you know, to do it all by yourself. And Socrates says of such a director, he says, it is not easy to find. And then, if he could be found as things are now, seekers in this field would be too arrogant to submit to his guidance. And a big part of this is because a lot of it, especially initially, seems counterintuitive. It goes against conventional understandings of the way things are. Socrates says that if the state as a whole should join in superintending these studies and honor them, these specialists would, would accept advice, and continuous and strenuous investigation would bring out the truth. So we can't just compartmentalize it. It's not just something that we kind of read a little bit on the commercial breaks. It's something that we have to really throw ourselves into. And when we're focused on, when we're doing philosophy, we need to focus completely on it and really put our whole soul into it and honor it. And if you take that approach to it, then you can start to accept the advice. You can start to internalize it and give a continuous and strenuous investigation then gradually you will start to have insights. And he says that even now, lightly esteemed as they are by the multitude and hampered by the ignorance of their students as to the true reasons for pursuing them, they nevertheless, in the face of all these obstacles, force their way by their inherent charm. And it would not surprise us if the truth about them were made apparent. So at the beginning of book six, Socrates talked a little bit about the philosopher and why philosophers are not appreciated in mainstream society. And he's saying here that even though most people do not appreciate philosophy, it doesn't get the respect that he believes it deserves, still there is something about these studies that is appealing to us. Here he's using the word charm. In some translations, the word grace is used. But either way, saying that there's something compelling about these studies, something, even if it all seems a little bit crazy and all that just doesn't seem right, there's still something that draws us in. And if we listen to that intuitive sense that there's something worthwhile here, then we can get into these studies. And if we face it with the attitude discussed before with the whole soul and honoring these studies, then he says it will not surprise us if the truth about them are made apparent. And so that's what he means by solid geometry. Now we're going to go on to astronomy and we're going to see that again he's not talking about what we think astronomy is. He's not talking about the study of the stars and the planets. He says, I for my part and am unable to support that any other study turns the soul's gaze upward than that which deals with being and the invisible. But if anyone tries to learn about the things of sense, whether gaping up or blinking down, I would never say that he really learns. So the study of astronomy is not about studying the patterns in outer space, those patterns of, of stars and planets. That's not what he means. It ha we are focusing on being or the realm of being of um, absolute reality, the realm of the intelligibles, and that is invisible. It's beyond the physical realm. So what is the true study of astronomy? The movements, namely of real speed and real slowness in true number and in all true figures, both in relation to one another and as vehicles of the things they carry and contain. These can be, ha be, I can't speak today, sorry about that. These can be apprehended only by Logos and Dianoia, and not by sight. Or do you think otherwise? By no means. So notice here, he's talking about what is real, what is true, real speed, real slowness, true number, true figures. These are the absolute realities, the eidos, um, ideas or forms in academia these absolute realities that are in the intelligible realm. So he's always focusing on the intelligible realm, but different aspects, different ways of approaching it. So again, in our readings, in our contemplations, these are things to think about. You may think about the five genera of reality that are considered at the roots of all creation, being, 
rest, motion, same, indifferent. These are discussed most directly in the dialogue, The Sophist. They're also discussed often through, um, you can read about them in Proclus or in Plotinus, and, um, and these are the, considered to be at the root of all of creation. Or just focus on any of the Eidos that, that you're interested in, in contemplating. But this contemplation, this type of contemplation, is what he means by astronomy. He says, then we must use the blazonry of the heavens as patterns to aid in the study of those realities, just as one would do who chanced upon diagrams drawn with special care and elaboration by Daedalus or some other craftsman or painter. For anyone acquainted with geometry who saw such designs would admit the beauty of the workmanship, but would think it absurd to examine them seriously in the expectation of finding in them the absolute truth with regard to equals or doubles or any other ratio. So remember geometry again, we're studying that highest experience of like seeing the sun itself in its own place, the idea of the good. And anyone who's acquainted with that study would recognize that studying the physical bodies in outer space is not going to bring you to absolute truth. So he's tying together geometry and astronomy. He says it is by means of problems, then, as in the study of geometry, that we will pursue astronomy, too. And we will let be the things in the heavens, if we are to have a part in the true science of astronomy, and so convert to right use from uselessness that natural indwelling intelligence of the soul. So what are the problems that we use? Those are the questions that come up as we are reading metaphysics, as we're contemplating metaphysics and what it means to be human. What are we in reality? What is reality itself? What is that upper world that um, Socrates was alluding to in that allegory? It is by means of these problems that we pursue both geometry and astronomy. And that brings us to harmony. Again, harmony could be the study of music. You could approach it that way, but again, you don't have to. Here's what he says. We may venture to suppose that as the eyes are framed for astronomy, so the ears are framed for the movements of harmony. And these are in some sort kindred sciences, as the Pythagoreans affirm, and we admit. Do we not, Glaucon? We do. Okay, so at first blush, it doesn't really seem like astronomy and harmony have a whole lot in common. We certainly don't think of them as kindred sciences. But bringing up Pythagoras does help to tie them together. Now, Pythagoras was a mathematician and a mystic who had a secret school. He lived before Plato's day, actually, even before Socrates' day. And uh, very little is known of what exactly was taught in his school because everyone took a vow of secrecy. However, some people did talk a little bit, and we do know a little bit about what went on there. We know that he focused on math. We know that he saw numbers as a doorway into the divine. And that's very much um, consistent with what the way Socrates talked about arithmetic. And Pythagoras saw that as well. And he would... We know that he taught a lot of these subjects, um, arithmetic and geometry and uh, astronomy, and also music was included. He recognized the connection between music and math, and so he also focused very much on music. And so bringing up Pythagoras is a way to tie music in with all these other topics. And he says that their method exactly corresponds to that of the astronomer, the musician the, and the astronomer. Their methods correspond. For the numbers that the musicians seek are those found in these herd concords. I'm sorry, the, the numbers that the astronomer seeks are the same ones that are heard by the musicians when they're playing music. And so what he's pointing to here is that whether you're studying, whether you're contemplating um, the absolute realities through music or through astronomy, through math, through the study of metaphysics directly, we're all focusing on the absolute realities 
the numbers beyond the concept of number. It's not just a human invention. It's more of a human discovery. Glaucon calls it a superhuman task. Socrates says, say rather useful, a useful task for the investigation of the beautiful and the good. But if otherwise pursued, it's useless. That is likely. And what is more, I take it that if the investigation of all these studies goes far enough to bring out their community and kinship with one another and to infer their affinities, then to busy ourselves with them contributes to our desired end, and the labor taken is not lost, but otherwise it is in vain. So we already can see here that the investigation of the good refers to, again, seeing the sun itself in its own place. The beautiful was the way he described the experience of um, that highest experience, like seeing the sun itself in its own place, the way he described that in um, the symposium. He called it the beautiful. So again, focusing us on that kind of experience, on that realm of knowledge. Glaucon says that it is a huge task of which you speak, Socrates. And now Socrates is going to really just take a turn. He says, are you talking about the preamble or what? Or do we not know that all this, all these five studies we just talked about, they're nothing but a preamble of the law itself, the prelude of the strain that we have to apprehend. And what he's referring to here is dialectic. Socrates says, this then at last Glaucon is the very law which dialectic recites, the strain which it executes, of which, though it belongs to the intelligible, we may see an imitation in the progress of the faculty of vision, as we described its endeavor to look at living things themselves and the stars themselves, and finally at the very sun. That was the part of the allegory where you were out of the cave. In like manner, when anyone by dialectic attempts through discourse of logos and apart from all perceptions of sense to find his way to the very essence of each thing and does not desist till he apprehends by thought itself, and there you see the Greek, the nature of the good in itself, he arrives at the limit of the intelligible as the other in our parable came to the goal of the visible. So he's comparing this limit of the intelligible to seeing the sun in that allegory. And so what he's saying here is that the earlier studies, our contemplations as we're reading metaphysics and thinking about numbers in themselves or the absolute realities, what are they really? What is speed? What is real quickness beyond our idea of quickness? and so on. When those contemplations are taking us up what he called the rough and steep ascent out of the cave. But once we get out, once we have some familiarity with these sorts of contemplations, once we've raised our power some, and we've had some experiences, now we are ready to use dialectic. This is We can use dialectic all along, but its true use, its fullest use, is here. Once we have enough experience to be out here and um, contemplate things fully in themselves. And Socrates asks, Is not dialectic the only process of inquiry that advances in this manner, doing away with hypotheses up to the first principle itself in order to find confirmation there? And it is literally true that when the eye of the soul is sunk in the barbaric slew of the Orphic myth, dialectic gently draws it forth and leads it up, employing his helpers and cooperators in this conversion of the studies and sciences which we enumerated, which we called sciences often from habit, though they really need some other designation, connoting more clearness than opinion and more obscurity than science. Understanding, I believe, was the term we employed. So what he's referring to here is the divided line. And what we saw before is that um, these two are inside the cave. Here we have that 
um, that path leading us out of the cave, and this is out of the cave. And so he's saying that we call these studies like arithmetic and geometry and astronomy and so on, we call them sciences, but it's more from habit. They need some other name. They have more clearness than opinion or belief, but they're more obscure than science or what we call before knowledge. And so we have the name understanding because assumptions are still guiding us when we're not yet out of the cave. We see the sunlight, we're focused on that world, thinking about things in themselves or what are numbers beyond concepts. Our eye, our focus is on that world out of the cave, but we don't yet see that world. We still carry assumptions with us, and that's why it has more obscurity than science. And uh, okay, those who have survived the tests and approved themselves altogether the best in every task and form of knowledge must be brought at last to the goal. And so all of this was leading us out. We want to see the sun itself. We shall require them to turn upward the vision of their souls and fix their gaze on that which sheds light on all. And when they have thus beheld the good itself, they shall use it as a pattern for the right ordering of the state and the citizens and themselves throughout the remainder of their lives. So he's calling this the goal, but I do want to point out here that it's not really the end. Because remember we saw in the, in the cave allegory last week that there's someone in the cave who helps the person who just got released from, from their shackles and says, hey, what is that? What is that? What is that? And this person who drags them kicking and screaming up that ascent to the mouth of the cave. This person is functioning as a teacher or as a guide. And so Plato stresses throughout all of his dialogues that our goal is not, well, he's calling this a goal. This is the goal, but um, the goal of our, our gaining wisdom, but we have to act on that. And throughout this dialogue, especially, this is really a focus. The idea of the philosopher king is someone who acts on that wisdom. So this is the goal of how to gain wisdom, but it's not the final goal of our lives. It's not, we're not just like off on a cloud enjoying our wisdom. We want to go back down into the cave and function through that wisdom. And now here's just one final word here, which is not directly connected to anything that I talked about today, but I really like this quote. Socrates says at the very end of book seven, you must not suppose that my words apply to the men more than to all women who arise among them endowed with the requisite qualities. Amen. So we're going to end book seven there. And next week we're going into book eight. And what we're going to see in book eight is that here's where Socrates starts to talk about the different constitutions. And constitution has a dual meaning. Um, you can talk about the soul's constitution and also about a state's constitution. And so he's going to be playing with that terminology, and we're going to see what he says about that. I do hope you enjoyed what you saw, and I appreciate a thumbs up if you did. And also, please think about subscribing if you don't already, because I do put out a new video each week, and you'll get a notification if you subscribe. If you have any questions about anything I talked about today or anything you're reading outside of what I talked about today, feel free to uh, leave a comment or send me an email. And uh, I do hope you'll join me next week. Thank you very much.